of all the Nazi crimes against humanity, the name of Theresienstadt stands alone. Today there is hardly a trace that this was once the strangest of all the concentration camps and that it was used to spread the most monstrous lies of the war. You can feel this place has been forever desecrated. Now it is almost deserted. But at one time, 140,000 people passed through the gates of Theresienstadt. Of them, perhaps only hundreds are still alive. They witnessed the turning of a town into a grotesque showplace intended to fool the world. Edith Sheldon was only 15 when she was transported to the camp, and she was there from nearly the beginning to the end. What she and other survivors have brought with them to Australia is one of the most bizarre episodes of the Second World War. When the Nazis invaded Czechoslovakia, the task of solving the problem of the Czech Jews was given to one of Hitler's most ruthless henchmen, Reinhard Heydrich. In 1941, Heydrich hit upon the ploy of creating a camp that could be readily disguised, and for this purpose he chose the fortress town of Theresienstadt. It was situated close to Germany, and its small population could be easily relocated. Built in the 18th century to honor the Empress Maria Theresa, it was never used as a fortress and served only as a garrison town. But as a concentration camp, it suited Heydrich perfectly. It was completely walled in, it had huge barracks and was surrounded by a moat. Nearby was the small fortress, which was already a Gestapo prison. Any troublemakers from the new camp could be sent there for punishment. From the very beginning, Theresienstadt was founded on lies. When the Czech Jews were evicted from their homes, they were told they would be protected there for the duration of the war. For the elderly, Theresienstadt would be a place of safety and comfort. My mother was looking after old people, nursing old people, which was a job nobody wanted to do because it was just indescribable. The conditions the old people lived in, they uh, had no sanitation and they couldn't get to the bathroom, so they had no food, they couldn't wash themselves, there wasn't enough staff to wash them and the stench was just unbelievable. When the unsuspecting German Jews were rounded up, they were promised a resort town with private apartments, parks and gardens. Many believed that Theresienstadt was to be their reward for loyal service to Germany in the First World War. They were very well dressed, they had nice coats, they brought pictures, some of them had nice pictures and wanted to make their beautiful spa stay very nice so they saw they will do it all and when they arrived into this big barracks with about 100 people in one big room so they just couldn't understand what happened they were asking where is our beautiful accommodation and everybody had to tell them it's nothing like that in Theresienstadt those veterans from World War One, they were all enthusiastic Germans and they were promised that they are transferred to an old people's home and a settlement. And I remember one scene when I was approached by one of those veterans with a wooden leg, and he asked me, uh, could you tell me where Beach Road is? And I told him, there is no Beach Road here. Why do you ask? We haven't got the beach. 
And he said, because I bought, I have a contract for a house which I bought in Beach Road. Particular people who had come from good backgrounds, uh, wealthier backgrounds, uh, arriving in these case casernes or barracks with no beds, no nothing, it was uh, very bad weather and so on, where they were so desperate that uh, some of them just went straight to the windows, they were on the uh, second floor and just jumped, and um, it just looked so hopeless that uh, you wouldn't be surprised if most of us hadn't committed suicide. Yeah, when I arrived there, so we got just the space of a suitcase and not an inch on both sides more. And this way you could sleep, sit, or read, or whatever you did. This was for two years. Exactly two years I had uh, this space for my own. But the Theresienstadt the Nazis didn't want the world to see was portrayed at great risk by a group of gifted artists who secretly painted everything they saw. impression of the place, the impact of the place. You know, we were suddenly transferred from a middle-class life into slum life. And figures around me, I just wanted to preserve the whole picture. I tried first to get the camera, but it wasn't possible. And then I saw a friend sketching the scene, an architect. So I thought I should try it Myself, I never had tried it before. I never went sketching before. So the only way to get sketching material was to get it from outside at that time. So I wrote an illegal letter with the help of a gendarme. I wrote, wrote an illegal letter to my fiancé who was back in our hometown. And I asked her, I remember exactly, for a sketchbook, for a pencil and for an eraser and I really got it. And so that was the way how, how I started to sketch. There was an epidemic of typhoid earlier in 42, 43, which took a lot of children and young people and um, the old people had nobody to look after them, so they got lice, and it was very sad, really. And there was very little food. You could see the old people scraping away at uh, sort of the barrels where the soup was served from. The, the, I think they were the worst off, really, because uh, the old people only got the basic ration, which was very, very meager. Breakfast was a ersatz coffee, which we didn't bother because by the time you queued up, you lost uh, so many calories just standing there queuing up that it wasn't worth queuing up for it. And uh, you got, uh, there were special longish loaves of bread and you got a quarter loaf every three or four days, I forget, I think twice a, twice a week you got a quarter loaf of bread. The main thing is we look forward to the bread. That was our staple food. And this bread was just non-existent after a day or two. Some people couldn't wait to keep it for two days. They just swallowed it practically the first day when they got it. And uh, actually, this is what happened with my good teeth at the end, uh, that uh, after a very short time, I, I broke them because uh, it was just so bad and stale. You got potatoes, which looked everything except potatoes with the sauce, which was lilac, mauvish, rotten. And uh, once a week we had a piece of, a tiny piece of meat, 
which was horse meat, which was uneatable, sweet, hard, uncooked. And uh, I haven't seen vegetables for four and a half years and fruit whatsoever. It didn't enter the camp. It didn't exist. A friend of ours who worked uh, in the kitchen stole a couple of potatoes. And uh, so we bought this uh, paprika, which was uh, a crushed red brick, paprika substitute, and uh, caraway seed substitute, which was uh, crushed uh, bark, tree bark. And uh, my friend, another friend who stole uh, an onion from the field, my friend made a goulash out of it. It was probably the best goulash I ever ate. To complete the illusion of a normal town, the Nazis ordered the setting up of a council of Jewish elders. The council made improvements, but its very existence allowed the Nazis to claim that Theresienstadt was self-ruling with its own leaders and its own police. I worked night shift with the police force there. One woman, one man, just watching old people going to the toilets or if anybody gets sick. The lavatory was just a, a piece of wood. And I went with my sister-in-law and she slipped with one foot and she dropped right into it. Plus her teeth and everything and I had to get her out. Which was beautiful. <laughs> Night to remember. Now we can laugh. If we could, we pulled them out, but sometimes you couldn't. When it was so full, you just couldn't. They just stayed there. The plan for Theresienstadt worked so well that a multitude of people from all over occupied Europe arrived, even those who were only part Jewish. What they had left really were people who didn't even know that they had Jewish ancestors, yet they found them in some way back in their family tree, they were a Jew. And so they were sent to Theresienstadt, which was considered a preferential camp. And uh, they arrived there and they were absolutely bewildered to live in this Jewish community now when they never even knew that they had some Jewish blood in their veins. I met a, a Jewish boy when I was uh, 16 and there was a group of women, um, mostly non-Jewish women, who had uh, Jewish boyfriends and they went there as messengers to smuggle food, money and messages in and out. And at night, when it was dark, I went to the meeting place, which most of the time was a big barn and uh, I remember it was totally dark and, and I was scared and I knocked at, at, at the gate and then my boyfriend opened up and I went inside and then we exchanged, uh, you know, I handed over the goods that I bought and, and he told me what's going on and um, I took back again little, little notes from people uh, from guys who had their girlfriends and, and parents in Prague and I did that nine times uh, before he was caught with the money and the messages and the whole luggage by a, it was sort of a Czech country policeman and um, that, uh, that he is being locked up. Goldie was a very sporty, very intelligent, well-educated man. He was into electronics and into photography. And he was my first love. I was very much in love with him. He opened a totally new world for me. And so I had everybody there and all my friends. So uh, I had this uh, unusual idea that um, I thought um, I want to be there too. So I, I went to the... Uh, some Jewish, I don't know what it was called. And I said, uh, you know, how about it? And he said, well, you can't go because uh, you are on your birth certificate, a Protestant, you know. 
that's out. And so I found the way that I had to become a Jew. I mean, it's not a religious thing for me. It was just the idea of, of being there with everybody. And I had to have lessons, and I had to go to what is called mikveh, sort of a Jewish bath, like a, like a Christianing thing in Jewish. And and then I, I went and, and uh, told them, okay, now I'm Jewish, now deport me. And on the 19th of May, 1943, uh, I was deported to Theresienstadt. Life in the camp was like a nightmare, an absurd bureaucratic nightmare. Everyone was entered in at least 17 different files, yet nothing was certain, only the Nazi rules and ridiculous prohibitions, and even they were changed at whim. People weren't allowed to sing or whistle in the streets. No one was allowed to touch a chimney sweep for luck. Abortions were compulsory, but smoking was regarded as a serious crime. As I quite was a smoker before, <laughs> I didn't want to miss out there too. So we got tea leaves. I hold the tea leaves in, in uh, newspapers or any piece of papers that didn't make any difference and was sitting in the morgue and this was the only place where the German never ever entered. And this there I was sitting and smoking in peace. But if I would have been caught, they would hang me. But truly amazing was the emergence of an extraordinary culture. Theresienstadt had some of Europe's finest actors, composers and musicians, and they created plays and operas. It was done with nothing, but reached out to everyone. For an hour or so, people could forget. I remember seeing Carmen and uh, Aida, but in particular, we saw a Czech children's opera, and I've made the costumes for the children, and the whole thing was absolutely fabulous. And I also remember that the SS was in the audience, and I couldn't help but clapping, because it was absolutely fabulous. The only thing I still see in my mind is the main figure, which was a little boy, fantastic actor, with a little moustache, looking like Hitler, acting like Hitler, but like the, like the crazy Hitler. So he absolutely ridiculed Hitler, and they ridiculed the system. How they could perform it, how they dared to, to perform it, and how they got away with it, it's still a puzzle for me. Despite all their promises, the Nazis never intended Theresienstadt to be a place of final destination. And within a year, there were regular deportations. Then in May 1942, Heydrich was assassinated in Prague. His departure set the stage for the entrance of Adolf Eichmann, an ambitious young SS officer and self-appointed expert in Jewish affairs. He began taking a personal interest in Theresienstadt and ordered a massive speeding up of transports out of the camp. At one stroke, the whole purpose of the camp became clear. Theresienstadt was just a transit camp, and there was now the terrifying reality of families being separated 
and of being sent somewhere further on. We had absolutely no idea where all those people went. Uh, people were loaded on the trains, they were permitted to have, I think, 50 kilos of luggage, and we were told they go to Germany uh, to work. They were told that they are going to go to another ghetto, to the east. Transports came and transport went, but only at night, so three or four o'clock at night, the door was open and one of the SS or SA or whoever was there, just asked number, we have been numbers, we haven't been names. Number so and so, be in the morning and this and this time, ready to be transported. The whole city was like, uh, you could feel it. it. The whole air was shivering because everybody was so nervous and waiting for the transport because nobody knew who will be in it. Normally, they always had a thousand people went in a transport, and they usually called up 1,200, 200 reserve. And uh, the selections were made. One day they took all the solicitors and their families, and one day they might take all the people who had tuberculosis, and one day they might take all the people from the middle of the alphabet, and next day they would take people over 60, and next day people between 50 and 55. It was just. Uh, a very random selection. In 1943, my whole family, that was my father, my brother, uh, my mother and grandmother, we were uh, transported to Auschwitz. I was uh, 13 years old then. Uh, we were shipped to Birkenau and uh, we were put into a place called actually a family lager, which was actually very unusual because most of the places in Auschwitz were separate women and separate men. And this particular one was called the family, family camp. The camp where we were in, in Birkenau was a special camp. The ways of the Nazis were different, you can't explain it. So this camp held people from Theresienstadt who came there and didn't go straight into the gas chambers, but had the destination on their March papers six months special treatment. And we knew from the beginning that it means six months staying in the camp and dying after six months. They took everything what we had, even our little uh, little knife or little comb or whatever we had, everything was taken away. The only thing we were left was the clothes we arrived in and uh, we were issued a little little round bowl and a spoon and that, that was all. We didn't own anything at all anymore. We had no name, we had only a number. Uh, we were not referred to as actually human beings, but just numbers. But the people sent to the family camp had one more role to play. They were forced to write glowing postcards to relatives in Theresienstadt, saying how well they were being treated and how little there was to fear in Auschwitz. Thousands of prisoners were then ordered to post-date their cards, and a few days later, they were sent to their death. 
When their relatives in Theresienstadt received these cards months later, they were deceived into believing that Auschwitz wasn't such a bad place and that the writers of the postcards were still alive. Actually, we lived in Birkenau for eight months. Uh, lived is a very difficult word to say, lived, because you existed. Um, unfortunately, where the camp was situated, uh, we could see the chimneys, and we could see the railway, and we could see daily all the transports coming in, just disappearing. Of course, once you lived there for eight months, you know what's going on. You knew exactly what, what was happening. Um, we lived in the fear, when is our turn? Well, as it happened, I don't know why it took that long before they dissolved the camp. They dissolved the camp and uh, took the strongest people um, out and we were told, I mean not told, but we heard rumours that the people will be sent to work. That was the last time I've seen my father because they took him away, which we didn't know where, and they separated my little brother and my grandmother and me and my mother, we were sent at that time with hundreds of other people to the main camp of Auschwitz, where we didn't know what's going to happen to us. Uh, as it turned out, we were there for a few days, and uh, I don't know what happened with us. We somehow got separated from the normal group, and we were hoarded with, I can't remember, maybe another 50, 60 people. And actually, we went to the guest chambers. Well, we went inside, uh, but we knew rumours actually what they looked like, and it was exactly like it. They looked like showers. Everybody was quiet. Uh, people were all so terrified that they couldn't even scream. We got in there, and miracles happened. That day, something went wrong with the equipment, and we were again sent back the block. And that was a miracle how I am here today and my mother too. In Theresienstadt, the men were put to work extending the railway line right into the camp. Transports would now arrive and leave every few days and the population was constantly changing. No one was safe from deportation. My mother was then, towards the end in October, 44 conscripted into the transport, and I went to the head of the gardening section, Mr. Kursavi, and begged him to be released so that I could go with my mother. And uh, he knew my family, and he said, uh, I told him who I was, and he said, I'm not releasing you, and you'll be very thankful to me later on. So I tried to get into the transport I uh, to get in go with my mother but in the end my mother didn't go she was in the reserve and I stayed behind also only our luggage went <laughs> our blankets which we were very sorry about because we were very cold in the middle of the night I've been called in the transport with 5,000 other people and uh, we have been all in one place in one of the uh, barracks and they called out every single number except mine. The luggage in the meantime left already to Auschwitz. And in the last moment, just between the train and the door from the, from the barracks, they called me out. I have to stay behind. This never ever happened before. And uh, it was a miracle. I'm here. All the sanitary personnel were protected for most of the time. And uh, then I worked in the agriculture and uh, the people on the top of the list in each group were protected. If you slacked in your work, you got to the bottom of the list. If you worked very hard and if you were healthy enough, you remained at the top of the list. 
Well, I, I saw that I don't get anywhere uh, being in Theresienstadt, so eventually I tried to get further on still in my search to find out what happened to my boyfriend, whom I called Goldie. And uh, so I went to the office there, and I said that I want, uh, you know, to be, uh, to go on, to go to, to, um, to be um, transported um, for work or whatever, to get out of Theresienstadt. And I was eventually in September 44, I was in a transport, and we came to uh, this uh, horrible place where it, it said, Arbeit macht frei, Auschwitz. And somehow, uh, you know, with the electric wires, uh, we knew uh, that, that uh, we have come to, to sort of something like a concentration camp. And we were herded out of the trains and put into uh, fives, uh, I don't know, there were a thousand people, maybe more. And then we had to walk um, past a table where uh, a very good-looking man stood with very polished boots, and he, were, he wore gloves, and he made right, left, right, left, uh, which we also did not know what it meant, but uh, uh, afterwards, of course, I found out that all the women and children went to one side and I, uh, with all the people capable to do work, went to the other. And later on, uh, I saw pictures of Mengele and, and I knew it was Mengele who was sorting us. We had to go for a selection uh, in front of Dr. Mengele. Dr. Mengele was standing here we had to all strip and we had to march naked in front of him and uh, he said either left or right well by looking at the situation we could sort of quickly summarize what was going on because to the right when the people who looked a bit stronger and didn't look sick and to the left when the older people the younger people, but we had no choice. We just had to march in front of him and wait for our fate. As it happened, my mother went in front of me and she was sent to the right. Well, in that moment, I knew, well, that is all right. Mummy's been picked to go to work. Another miracle happened. Another SS came and talked to Dr. Mengele. Dr. Mengele turned, and in that split second, I said, well, what can happen to me now? I run to my mother. If he turns back, i either be there, and he won't see me. So I took the chance. I ran quickly to the right, and I hid behind my mother. And when Dr. Mengele looked back at all the other women there, I wasn't there. It was the next, next woman's turn. So I was safely hiding behind my mother and another, another prisoner, and that's the way I got out of Auschwitz. There were some people who were protected from the transports that were the people who at the time were in the Judenrat, the governing sort of body, but that also was subject to change. And then the whole lot were sent with their family and all the people that, all the hangers on. And that uh, first there were Czechs and then there were Germans and then there were Austrians in the end. So there were three changes of government sort of Jewish government in the camp and these people were protected for a time but not forever. But there's always been the question in many minds, how much did the Eltestenrat or Council of Jewish Elders really know about the fate of the transports and about Auschwitz? Well, a fellow called Lederer es escaped from Auschwitz and wrote to a girlfriend of one inmate of friend of his in Theresien's not a letter. I happened to smuggle the letter in to Theresienstadt and gave it unread to the recipient of the letter. About an hour later, he and another friend of his came to tell me the contents and they were really alarming. We learned for the first time about gas chambers and about all the horrors of, of Birkenau or Auschwitz, if you want to call it. And we went to consult the Eltestenrat what to do about it. They told us that they already knew of the horrors of, of Auschwitz because it was smuggled through in a, in a sardine, box of sardines, 
and warned us not to tell anything to anybody about it. I don't know how much they knew, but even if they would have heard, you have to put yourself in their position. They couldn't believe it, even if somebody came to tell them the story. They just couldn't believe it or didn't want to believe it, what was really going on in the gas chambers. Those who did know about Auschwitz have often been asked, why didn't they resist? Why didn't they take up arms? The reason is that was no Warsaw. In Warsaw, they had possibilities. They had outside help, the possibilities to, to make their own arms, to defend themselves. That was not possible in, in the Riesenstadt. The growing rumors about death camps led the International Red Cross to request an inspection of Auschwitz. Eichmann kept delaying, but they grew more insistent, and finally he came up with a proposal more to his liking. Why not visit Theresienstadt, which he claimed was exactly like other concentration camps, only a little more luxurious. But Eichmann needed time to prepare the camp, and that was the start of the grandest scheme of all the great beautification. I was given a job of uh, cleaning the pavements, the joints between the uh, uh, bricks with a toothbrush. The Germans decided the dormitories looked too crowded with three tiers of bunks, so the top tier was cut off, and uh, as a consequence, one third of the people, or roughly that, were sent to Auschwitz to make the place less crowded. And uh, this, uh, the sidewalks were scrubbed and the houses where the commission was going to walk were painted, nothing behind but just there. And uh, all of a sudden shops appeared and all the things that were plundered out of our suitcases were being offered for sale for ghetto money. They had banks with fake money, they have shops with fake things in it. Everything was fake. It was a make-believe word, a crazy make-believe word for the Swiss Commission to see. Worthless bank books were issued and the Nazis worked overtime producing false documentation to prove their good intentions. Thousands of prisoners were ordered to make the camp look beautiful for the big day, the 23rd of June. 1944. Where I was uh, staying at the time, downstairs they established a post office and when the commission arrived they were handing certain people were called upon to receive parcels and they were f the commission saw them receiving the parcels what they did not see that around the corner the Germans took the parcels off them again and redistributed the same parcels to the next lot of people. Also, a pavilion was built for the children, who I think numbered 14 at the time. And uh, beds were made, specially made, short, I think five foot or whatever they were. And we were each issued a glass with toothbrush and toothpaste, which we were, of course, not allowed to touch. And um, we had to sleep in those little tiny beds because they we were about 17, 16, 17 at the time, but there were no children, so we had to pretend to be children. We had to get undressed in the cellar so we shouldn't bring the smell of manure or what have you up to the room because the pretense was that we were at school all day, and that's why we weren't there when the commission arrived. There was a pavilion built where musicians happened to be practicing Mary Tunes just for the time when the Red Cross came. Of course, the Resienstadt was full of people. There were over 45,000 people there. And every room was packed. But as it so happened, just one room was set aside where the visitors would so-called accidentally happen to inspect. And that room had only two beds instead of usual 14 to 16 beds. And the visitors, by pure coincidence, selected just that house and just that room to see how nice the Jews really lived. The Red Cross inspection lasted only five hours and 40 minutes. 
and what they saw was exactly what the Nazis wanted them to see. Fantastic lies were told that day. When the commission arrived, we had to go out into the fields in freshly washed and uh, pressed clothes, singing happily in formation, Czech national songs, which were forbidden before. They prepared like two places, like coffee shops, and it was all staged. And by the time the commission went to the first one, I, I was working there sort of as a waitress, just for the time being. And then we had to run quickly, and the girls, you know, who looked nice and were nicely dressed up, for that to run to the second one, uh, before the commission again came, so that it, it was just all, all like in the movies. Somebody tried to sort of make contact with the commission, but it was impossible. They, they were just too closely guarded and they just didn't see it was sham. People tried to draw their attention to it, but it just didn't work. Red Cross inspectors were completely fooled by the facade created for their benefit. When the Swiss delegate, Dr. Rossell, made his report, he said, Immediately on entering the ghetto, we were convinced that its population did not suffer from undernourishment. Certainly there are few populations whose health is as carefully looked after as in Theresienstadt. The smarter women were all wearing silk stockings and hats and carried modern handbags. The young men also seemed well turned out. Some of them were even flashily dressed. We found that the ghetto was a community leading an almost normal existence. It was such a total success that the Nazis in Berlin decided to capitalize on the hoax by making a film. In den schrebergärten der Familien gibt es ständig zu jeden und zu gießen, wächst jedoch ein willkommener Zuschuss für den Küchenzettel. Only the healthiest were chosen. The actors were fed extra rations and ordered to perform in situations they had never encountered before. Many of the scenes weren't even filmed in Theresienstadt. Eine kleine Barackenstadt ist das Arbeitszentrum. Only a damaged fragment of the film survived the war. But as a piece of propaganda, it is so convincing that even today it still has the power to fool people. The SS men who concocted this sham called it Hitler gives a town to the Jews. When the Arbeitstag ended and the Feierabend begins, strömen aus den verschiedenen Vorwerken und Arbeitsparaten die Arbeiter und Arbeiterinnen wieder in die Stadt zurück. Transport stopped during the filming, a temporary reprieve. But for Otto Pan, now living in Melbourne, it must have been a very strange experience. They put the camera onto me and uh, was uh, I was a principal of this bookkeeping office uh, and 
it was of course all a hoax. I realized that when they finished filming, it was all so they took all the books away again, and it was uh, like it was before. Alleinstehende Frauen und Mädchen machen es sich in ihrem Frauenheim gemütlich. The unfortunate stars of this film had now become inconvenient witnesses. As soon as their brief roles had ended, they were thanked by the Nazis, rewarded with extra food, and then most of them were sent to Auschwitz. The hoax was shown in the film, where they showed the reasons that what actually was a very bad concentration camp. They show as a Jewish settlement where people could live contently, but the hypocrisy in showing a film which they wanted to show to a gullible world who would have accepted it gladly because they would have had and had an excuse that they don't have to interfere, the Jews are all right, we don't have to bomb Auschwitz. The hypocrisy behind it was that by showing those people like the old people knitting and mainly the young people learning to trade. And the, the Nazis then knew exactly that those people are doomed to die, that they could the same day or the next day uh, be deported to Auschwitz and will be deported for sure, latest in one, two, three months. That, in my view, is the horror about the film. I had a friend with whom I shared everything we had. And at one stage, I really wanted to finish it all because I was so hungry, I didn't want to live anymore, any longer. And she gave me her, wanted to give me her ration because she said that she works in the office and I pull a cart instead of a horse that uh, my job is much more strenuous than hers. Now, she was as hungry as I was, but she was going to give me her ration to pull me through this depression of uh, wanting to finish it all. So that is real friendship. And you can learn about that only in a situation like that. By early 1945, both the Americans and the Russians were advancing into Czechoslovakia. For the people of Theresienstadt, it then became a race against time. Only 15,000 remained, and the Nazis had by now decided their fate. The Germans conceived of a plan of uh, blocking off a moat and flooding it with water and possibly drowning us all there. We didn't quite know what was happening, but we knew that something was cooking and we tried to sabotage it as much as possible. We mixed the mortar wrongly and uh, put things down wrongly and it had to be unpicked again, undone. And we knew that it was a matter of life and death for us to delay us to as much as possible. And we did. And then at one stage there was rumor that they were going to guess us inside the casemates and uh, something was being built there, but we didn't also know quite exactly what the plans were. They, the Germans changed their ideas, but we tried to delay it as much as possible. Then they started burning the documents. We realized what was happening when we saw little pieces of paper documents coming floating. The statistics, they kept very precise statistics on who came in and who went out the numbers, the names, occupations we had. Uh, they always had precise statistics on everything. And so all these statistics were being burned to destroy any evidence of how many people they sent to their death. Well, I had a friend who uh, worked at the elder's office. So she had pretty reliable news what's going on. And we knew that the end was very near. She read the papers, heard the news. And uh, there was uh, a false alarm that the Liberating Army is 
at the gates and many people rushed to the gates and eight prisoners were shot dead. Finally, the day of liberation came when the Russians entered Theresienstadt on the 9th of May, 1945. But even then, it wasn't over. There was yet another ordeal to face. The typhus came in several waves, and the people who got it first got the, they were the biggest casualties. And then later on, it somehow the potency declined, and it wasn't quite as bad. And I got pneumonia with it, and uh, I lost my hair. My hair started falling out. And I thought, I'll, if I survive, I finish my life as, uh, without hair. So I was very worried about it. And just came out in handfuls in the morning. I it was uh, just handfuls lying there. Then it was time to leave in search of homes and families. For most, there was nothing. Families had been decimated. Whole communities had disappeared. The children of Theresienstadt were never given a chance to tell their own story. Of the 15,000 children who entered the camp, only 100 survived the war. Only their drawings remain. little done to find out the truth about Theresienstadt because who once was there as I nearly five years now it was a horror camp all right we didn't have a gas chamber but you you can live in horror without gas chambers as well Theresienstadt in spite of all deceit for me as I see it today was nothing else than the paddock in front of the slaughterhouse, which was away 300, 400 kilometers. Well, uh, after the war, I mean, I was not successful with, with my own journey, so after the war, eventually, uh, I found out from somebody that Goldie jumped the train uh, to get away before, obviously, it, it, went, uh, it went to lodge the train, and that he was shot in the back um, by the Germans, and. So he was long, long dead before I even, you know, came to Theresienstadt myself. Yes, well, it is many years ago, and the whole thing seems like it happened to me in another life. It's unreal, really. For me, that, that was the saddest thing that, uh, you know, that through my interference, uh, and I still have this awful guilt that, that I caused his death, because I don't believe that, that if I wouldn't have gone there visiting that uh, he, he would be dead now because he would have lasted till 44 at Theresienstadt. And I always was hoping that somehow um, by being involved myself that maybe I can swap life so uh, that eventually he will come back because I didn't care if I didn't come back. So is Nekmusi, Nekmusi. 
Sie mir ja.